Hey everyone, I'm Josh. And I'm Jessica. Welcome to the branch. Hey, we want to know that you guys are here, so if you will pull out your phones and check in, that would be great. Guys, I've been a parent for like a year and a half. Yeah, like a year and a half. Uh, and it is so much to navigate. I mean, it's a blast, it's great, but uh, with the pandemic, social media, all the things, uh, adding one child has been a lot to deal with. I can't imagine uh, adding two, three, four, five, however many you guys have. So we see you and we see that and we want to help you. And so at the end of February, we're going to host a workshop for parents just like you called Parenting and Faith. We've invited Doug and Kimberly Condor to come from Kansas City to speak to us about how do you hear from the Lord and then apply that to your parenting in real time. So we hope that you sign up for that on the Branch app and can't wait to see you there. And this weekend, if you are a member of the branch, you're going to be receiving an email from us inviting you to join the online branch directory. This directory is going to give our members a safe and secure way to find each other's contact information. When you join, you will have complete control over what information is shared and what information is viewable to others. So when you get the email, make sure you join the online directory today. And if you are a member of the branch and you don't get that email, make sure and reach out to us at info at and we'll get you all set up. Again, that's for members. And if you're not a member, we have branch orientation on February 6th. It's right after church at both of our campuses. We'll eat lunch together. We'll talk about who are we as a church? What are we doing? And you'll have a chance to sign up to be a member to meet some staff and some volunteers as well. Uh, so if you just want to know a little bit more about us, come to branch orientation. So go ahead and download the branch app and you can register for that there. And speaking of the app, you can go ahead and be pulling up your sermon notes as we continue our journey through the book of Matthew. Josh, our very own Josh, is going to be taking us through this next lesson, so we're very excited to hear what he has to share with us. Again, we're so glad that you're here. Welcome to The Branch.
like Chris said, my name is Josh. I'm the next gen minister. I get to serve our families. So kids, youth, some young adults in there as well. It's a blast. And I love getting to do that. I also love getting to do this. I'm really excited to be here with you. And we're in the middle of a journey through the book of Matthew. So really quick, let me catch you up. If you were not here last week, or if you were and forgot, uh, Chris talked about the authority of Jesus uh, last week, that Jesus has authority over all of creation. Uh, all, uh, he can calm storms. He has authority over the storms, over demons, over disease, over the paralyzed, the marginalized. He has authority over all of it. And Chris walked us through a lot of different stories about the authority of Jesus. And at the end, uh, we see Jesus ultimately really wants us to know that Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. Uh, He does that by healing the, the paralytic after he had already said, your sins are forgiven. He says, so that you might know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, stand up and walk. He gets up, walks, and Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. And I would argue that no one probably knew that more so than Matthew himself. And we're gonna get to actually get a glimpse into Matthew's testimony and Matthew's story Uh, tonight. So Matthew 9, we're going to be in Matthew 9, 9 to 13. It's going to be up on the screen as well, but if you have your Bible, we'd love for you to um, go there with me. Let me go ahead and read it for us. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Okay, that's Matthew's story. How many of you have ever had a chance to share your story with a group of people or with someone? Yeah, a few of you guys, yeah. Um, I've had the privilege of being able to do that a few times. And I also, when I was the youth minister at FB, would train a lot of our high school students on how to share their story. Really simple formula. What was your life like before you started following Jesus? When did you start following Jesus? What was that like? And what was your life like after you started following Jesus? Really simple formula. And fortunately for us, Matthew follows that to a T. So it's going to be a little bit easy to follow. Um, but you have not, if you have not shared your story, that's okay. We all have one. We all have a story. We're all coming into tonight with a story of how we got here. Uh, For me, before I got here, I was at home galloping like a horse up and down my hallway with my one and a half year old. And now I'm here. So that, that's my story of the last six hours. And so we all have these stories that we're walking into today. And what we see in Matthew's testimony is that Jesus loves to intervene in the middle of our story, redeem it, rewrite it, and then use it. He does that all over, the, all over the place, all over scripture. He's just entering people's stories. They have this background, no matter where you've been, what you've done, Jesus intervenes in that story and he repackages it, rewrites it, redeems it, and then eventually uses it to extend his mercy to other people. And that's what we get to see in Matthew's story tonight. And if it's, uh, I, the, the thing that just sticks out to me at the very beginning, before we even walk through the story, is how many verses Matthew's story is. When I was taught how to study scripture, what you do is you realize, okay, well, how much time was actually spent talking about these things? We literally probably get one verse of Matthew's story. Now we get five, we read five, but only one of them is really his story. Yeah, it was in my tax booth. Jesus said, follow me. And so I got up and I did. And that's my story. That's basically what his story was. And I'm shocked because I would probably take up like a chapter or something. I'm going to let people know a little bit more about me. People are going to read this, right? I got to know how much Jesus has done in my life. He takes up five verses. Or one, depending on what you want to say. And so I think Matthew does that because he wants to point to the reality that Jesus saves, that Jesus redeems, and Jesus rewrites our stories. So let's see how Jesus does that for Matthew. He starts, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Remember last week, Jesus was in his hometown, and he had just healed the paralytic, forgave him of his, forgave him of his sins, uh, and then he's immediately going right to Matthew and calls Matthew. Now, we have talked a little bit about what tax collectors are, because Matthew's writing this gospel. He was a tax collector, but let me remind you, 
Um, a tax collector was a Jewish man that was recruited by the occupying army to raise taxes and to collect taxes for, uh, the fe- or from their native people so that they could raise money for themselves. So this was Rome. Rome was in charge of Israel and they would recruit people like Matthew and say, hey, come over here. I'm going to let you sit right here, collect everybody's taxes. This is what we're requiring of people. Uh, and now if you could just, you can add a little bit more on top of what we're requiring. And that was incentive. You don't have to just take what we're saying. Take a little bit more. Put that in your pocket as a thank you from the Roman, um, uh, Roman army. And so this led to the Jews uh, or the tax collectors being uh, the wealthiest group of Jews in the area. But it also led to them being the most hated. They were despised. It was like they were locking arms with the enemies of God. They, they had said no to God's people and yes to God's enemies. And they were hated for it. Nobody liked the Jewish tax collectors, especially Matthew. So he comes to Matthew in the tax booth and says, follow me. Uh, And he gets up and follows him. Now, this is not the first time we have heard uh, Jesus say these words. He has said, follow me uh, already in the gospel of Matthew. Uh, Chris mentioned a few weeks ago that when a rabbi was um, learning and kind of growing as a rabbi, he would never go to a student and say, hey, follow me. He would never initiate that because he was facing rejection which would have been an embarrassment. It probably would have hurt his career as a rabbi. So he never did that. But Jesus flipped the script. Again, rewriting the story. And he would constantly tell people to follow him. That was his MO. That's what he did. He didn't care about facing rejection. Not only was Jesus facing rejection here, but he was facing uh, a lot of criticism from the religious leaders. He has called people pretty low profile so far. James, John, Peter, Andrew, these kind of lowly, poor fishermen. Nobody really knows them. If Jesus calls them, okay, that's fine. But Matthew, a tax collector sitting in a booth at a very crowded intersection, and he says, follow me, and he gets up and he does. And I can just picture and hear the voices at that intersection when Jesus says that. Does he know who Matthew is? Does he know what he's done? Does he have any idea who he's calling to follow him and learn from him right now? So not only was Jesus facing rejection, but he was facing criticism from the religious leaders and those around him. But none of this holds Jesus back from doing it. He says, follow me. And none of this holds Matthew back from getting up and saying yes. He doesn't care about the criticism or what it might look like. He's excited. He gets up and follows him immediately. But what is Jesus' motive here? What, what is he trying to do? Is this like a stunt where he's just trying to kind of stun people? Or, or what's his heart here? Well, let's keep reading because I think we actually get to the heart of that. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, He said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Matthew gets up, follows Jesus. What happens next? Huge party. The Gospel of Luke tells us it was a huge feast. It wasn't just a little dinner party. It was a feast. Like Matthew rolled out all of the nice food, the nice wine, and Jesus is invited, and his disciples are invited. They're having a feast, and the Pharisees speak up and ruin it. And they're asking the question, why why is your teacher eating with those kinds of people? So it wasn't so much a question as an accusation. Okay, so let me try and explain. The, uh, The Pharisees saw the people that Jesus was hanging out with, tax collectors and sinners, as the worst of society. You did not associate with them. If you were a a religious leader or a rabbi, you risked being unclean by being around them. You have no idea where they've been. You have no idea what they've done. And you being around them risks you becoming unclean and kind of hurting your ability to be a rabbi and a religious leader. So from their perspective, you do not hang around those people. So not only that, but you're also setting a bad example for your disciples. I mean, what kind of lessons are you teaching by hanging around those types of people is, is their perspective. And so they asked uh, his disciples. So we kind of know what a tax collector is, but think of, uh, if you think of a sinner, if we know the story of the woman at the well or, or prostitutes and tax collectors, these were the people that were there. Like think that, I mean, th- this was the worst people in society. And Jesus is hanging out with them. And he's not just hanging out with them. Okay, he's eating dinner with them. 
for us, we can go to dinner after this, go to El Taco, get a couple tacos and kind of just have a good time with whoever and just it'll be nice, it'll be dinner and we'll go home and go to bed and it's fine. But in the first century, when you had a meal with somebody, you were communicating something pretty deep in doing that. You were communicating fellowship with that person or that group of people. And I would even go so far as to say you were identifying with them. That when Jesus is having this meal, now go with me, I know you might boo me off stage, but he was becoming one of these people. He wasn't just hanging out, getting to know him a little bit. He was saying, hey, I'm here. I'm with you. I'm one of you. I'm not scared of you. So the Pharisees, in their mind, they're seeing Jesus do this, and they're wondering, is he really who he says he is? Is he really the righteous, holy rabbi that he's claiming that he is? He's literally becoming one of these people. Now, he didn't go and take up tax collecting or start sleeping around. That's not what Jesus did. But he was communicating, I'm with these people. These are my people. So this is the second time already in this story. Jesus has done something radical. He called Matthew, a wicked, despised, deplorable Jewish man that nobody wanted anything to do with. And now he's hanging out with a bunch of tax collectors and sinners. Sin, rebellion, messiness, brokenness, the son of God, like God in the flesh, being with these people, excuse me. Why? Why why is he doing this? We get to the question again. We've seen two instances, but now we're really getting to the heart. Why was Jesus doing this? Well, we read it already. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick These people did nothing to deserve Jesus' attention. They did nothing. It was not like they were super awesome or, or really rich, or some of them were really rich, but they didn't do anything to deserve God's attention, Jesus' attention, yet they still grab his attention. Because Jesus came for those who are sick, not the well. Now, really quick. Jesus is not grouping two people together into two groups. He's not saying that there are those who are well, who have it all together. They, they actually are well, they're healthy. And then there are the sick people over here, and that's the people that I came for. That's not the two groups of people Jesus is splitting up here. He's splitting up two groups of people, that is true. He's splitting up one into, these are the people that are sick, and they know it. They admit it. They admit their need. And the people over here think that they don't have a need. Now, Chris talked last week about the foreign object uh, that lives in all of us, and namely our sin. By the way, I need to fact check that story because I don't think think that's true. The knife blade that's been in the dude's head for how long, four years or something? I don't know about that. That's crazy. But uh, his point was we all have a foreign object uh, in us, and it's sin. And it influences how we see things and how we live and what we do without us really even knowing it. So I don't want to go into talking about the theology of sin and how we're all sinful, broken people. If you want to hear about how bad you are, just talk to me later, and I would love to tell you. Um, but we're, we're, I'm not going to dive into that. But I do, want to, I do want to talk about something. Because we can leave a sermon like last week, and rightly so, saying, yes, I agree, amen, I'm a sinner, I need Jesus, now let's go get some lunch, and we're just going to go throughout daily lives until Sunday afternoon comes around and we lash out at our kids out of anger. And we start going through this cycle of, man, I feel like I should have this figured out by now. What, where is this coming from? Why am I lashing out in anger? Or we get to the middle of the week and we are reminded again that our relationships just aren't where they should be. We want them to be somewhere. And we can't seem to manage the baggage that we have in the past, the sin we've committed, the sin committed against us. And, and we have this real need Or it's a sin that we can't shake. It's something we've just been doing for years and we've been wanting to get rid of it. But And we can even sit in a sermon and say, amen. Yes, I'm a sinner. I need Jesus. But when it comes to the specific sins in our lives, it's a lot harder to say, amen, I'm a sinner. And look how it plays out in my life. Because that's scary. Who wants to admit those things? Who wants to put a name to it? Like, yes, I'm a sinner. No, no, no. I'm an adulterer. No, I'm a prideful person. I think that I'm in, I'm in control. I'm God. Nobody wants to put those types of labels on it. Myself included. The last thing I want to do is say that. 
So we can sit in a service and say, yes, I have a foreign object in me that influences me. But when we actually see it influences us, we don't say anything. Because we're afraid, what are people going to think? Are my kids going to resent me forever? Man, am I going to continue struggling with this sin? Are people going to leave when they find out that I'm 57 years old and I'm still struggling with lust and pornography? I can't be struggling with that anymore. And we let fear and embarrassment drive secrecy. And it's destroying us. And we get more sick and more toxic and it just keeps spiraling out of control. And we need to remind ourselves of Jesus' words that there are people who are sick and need me and I'm the physician. Because that's what he's applying, right? He's implying that, yes, there are people who are sick and know it. There's people that are not. And guess what? I'm the healer. I'm the physician. I'm the doctor. You cannot be healed by a doctor if you don't realize you need a doctor. A doctor can't heal you if you never go to them and say, hey, I need healing. And when we see these specific sins in our lives and we don't say anything, it's, us, it's like us saying, yeah, I'm sick, but not that sick. I don't really need the doctor, though. I mean, just look who Jesus hung out with. I mean, he was with people who were sick all the time and admitted it because their situations has brought them to their knees. And they knew how much they needed someone to do something. And they knew or thought maybe Jesus was the one that could do something about it. And I say none of this to condemn, none of this to judge, because I'm just there, I'm right there with you. There are things this last week that I'm like, gosh, I should probably confess that. (laughs) But we have to confess it. We have to say something. We have to bring it out into the light so Jesus, the healer, the physician, can actually go to work on it. Yeah, it it might hurt. Surgery hurts. That's not fun to go through. But it's needed so that Jesus can come in and intervene in our story, rewrite it, and use it. So we need to confess these things, these specific needs that we have, these specific sins that we have. We need to get them out in the open. Jesus came for the sick, not those who thought thought they had it all together. In fact, the Pharisees in this story are the ones that think they had it all together. They're the ones that are like, "Ah, I'm good. I I don't need that. In fact, I don't want anything to do with that. And it was that line of thinking that drove Jesus' next statement when he says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Go and learn was basically the vernacular for religious leaders to say, bro, you need to go study your Bible more. You need to go back to the text. You don't understand what you're talking about. Go read it, reapply it. And so in this scenario, it's Hosea 6, 6. Let me briefly tell you about Hosea. Crazy book. Go read it. It's A great but crazy book. In short, it's about the unfaithfulness of Israel. They began worshiping God and then stopped. They started to worship other idols and they were suffering the consequences of that. They weren't the only ones suffering the consequence though. The the nations around them were suffering the consequences. Why? Because Israel was a beacon of light pointing to the mercy of God. That when they lived in the way God had asked them to live, what they were doing was showing the world and the nations around them who God really was. That he's a God of mercy and grace and compassion, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. When they lived that out, people saw it and everything flourished. Everyone flourished. But when Israel started worshiping other gods, all of that went away. And the nations around them started not to see the real God, but all the idols that Israel started to worship. Now get this. This is what Jesus is quoting. The the Israelites in Hosea come back to God. They're like, oh man, yes, we want to repent. But God sees right through it. And he says, no, 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 no. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I don't care if you have the right offering or the right religious ritual. I don't care if you do things by the book. What I want you to do is extend my mercy to those around you. And so Jesus is saying this to the Pharisees at this dinner. Go read Hosea again. Because you're not living the way that I want you to live. You care so much about forms of worship and who you hang out with and who you can be around to climb the corporate ladder and all of these different forms of worship, rituals, offerings. You care so much about those, but you could care less about this person who needs God. And Jesus is exposing that. How? By just being around people who needed God. He was simply just being with them, identifying with them. 
getting on their level and it's exposing the idols in the Pharisees' hearts. Which drives Jesus' last statement, for I came not to call the righteous but sinners. What is he doing there? He's equating two groups of people who are the sick and sinners. He's not really talking about the sick. Who is he talking about? The sinners. The people that are far from God. The people that need the mercy of God. That's who he came for. That was his primary mission. His primary purpose was to come for the people who needed the mercy of God, not the people who thought they had it all figured out. Which kind of brings us back full circle, right? How do we start this story? Jesus calling Matthew. And then at the end it says, he came not to call the righteous, but sinners. What is Matthew saying? I'm one of them. That's me. It's like he's so eager to tell people that. He can't wait to just get it off his chest. I'm one of these people. These tax collectors and sinners, that was me. I was in the tax booth. I hadn't like stepped out, stopped collecting as much taxes, and then Jesus saw the improvement and said, okay, yeah, you can follow me. I was in the tax booth when Jesus called me. And I got up, followed him, and everything was different. Now, I wonder how hard that was for Matthew. Was it easy? I don't know. I can go both ways. I can see it being like a no-brainer for Matthew. Like, yeah, that guy just calmed a storm and cast out demons. I want to be with that guy. But I also see it over here where Matthew has this comfort and security and status with the Roman army. And his bank account is overflowing. His house is large. He can afford the best food, the best wine. And the moment he stood up in that tax booth, it was all gone. All gone. That had to have been hard. Jesus had just said, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You know where they're hanging out right now? In Matthew's mansion. He is practically saying no to that and yes to Jesus. Why would someone do that? Well, because he had heard stories about this rabbi Jesus, right? Right? He heard that this rabbi, Jesus, could stand in the middle of a storm and calm the waves with a word. That this rabbi, Jesus, could cast out a demon by just saying, go away. That he he could heal anyone of anything by just saying a word or just by a touch. He can just walk by someone and they can touch him on the shirt and they're healed. The power leaves them and they're healed. This is the guy that, that Matthew's saying yes to. And he also knew that he had the authority to forgive sins. And he knew that his primary need was not money, was not wealth, was not status or comfort, but the forgiveness and mercy of God. And he knew that nothing in this world could provide that for him. So he says yes yes to Jesus. He gets up and leaves the tax booth and was forever changed. Matthew was writing a story. He was living a story. Jesus intervenes, rewrites it, redeems it, and uses it. So what do we do with this story? Because we're talking about Jesus, who he is, what he does, who he hangs out with, but how can we um, learn from Matthew, (coughs) excuse me, how can we learn from Matthew and how to live? The first thing I think that we can learn is that following Jesus means remembering when you were called. (sighs) Remembering when you were called. Matthew didn't forget. He knew right where he was called. I was in the tax booth. I don't know what it is about following Jesus, but if you're anything like me, you can grow, mature, maybe sin a little bit less. Love your wife or or husband a little bit more. And then think, I guess I don't need as much of the mercy of God. I've kind of matured a little bit. And then you start trying to do life on your own. And that always goes really bad. And when we remember the mercy of God, When we remember when we were called, we're remembering the mercy he had for us before we were anything, any sort of mature. 
And so I wouldn't even ask right now, <clears throat> as you guys are sitting here, when were you called? Call that to mind right now. When was that moment <clears throat> that you followed Jesus? That you said yes? For me, I, I can remember I was in the back of my mom's maroon suburban. And uh, I was probably eight years old. <clears throat> and I was in the back and I was looking out the back window. And I don't know, for some reason that day I was just like, why wouldn't I do this? <laughs> it's such an interesting moment for me. My older brother was back there with me, which is ironic if you know that situation. And in that moment, I was like, why wouldn't I do this today? And I just said yes to Jesus, and I've been following him ever since. What was that moment for you? As you remember that moment, you're going to remember the mercy of God, which is going to stir your affections for Jesus. You're going to remember all that he's done for you. And that mercy was never meant to stay right there. I'm sorry. That mercy you're experiencing was never meant to just stay right there in your heart. It is meant to be extended to those around you. Which is the second point. <clears throat> Following Jesus means extending the mercy of God to those around you. I know that can be kind of a scary thing when we talk about that. Like, oh gosh, I can't share the gospel with someone. I don't know how to do that. That's scary. Well, good thing I'm not even talking about that. What did Matthew do? He threw a party. He literally just had his friends over. He had done something he had probably done over and over and over again. And this time, what was different? Jesus was there. Matthew probably ate dinner before this. And this time he just invited Jesus into it. That's what I'm talking about when I say extend the mercy of God. How are the people around you, the nations like in Hosea, how are the people around you going to see the mercy of God? It's by you rethinking how you do things. You see, following Jesus is not just about doing different things. It's about doing things differently. It's about seeing your daily life, your daily rhythms, your daily routines as an opportunity to, opportunity to invite Jesus into that space so that people will eventually ask questions, which is exactly what happens here. The Pharisees ask a question. Why? Because Matthew's doing something that you don't really do. And so what's that for you? Think about your daily rhythms, daily routines. What does it look like to invite Jesus into that space? Think about your meals. Like, what do you, where do you eat? Like, you eat, right? No? Yeah, okay, you eat. <clears throat> what if you just invited one of your non-Christian friends to eat with you? And you just prayed before the meal, and then you just listened to them, you just got to know them, and then you said goodnight, and you let them go their way. No pressure. Low bar, just eat with them. That's extending the mercy of God to those who do not know him. And this actually isn't in my notes, and I probably should stop talking because of my voice, but I'm going to keep going because I think, you can, I think you can measure the maturity of someone by the amount of mercy that they show. And I think that if you're never wanting to show mercy to people in need around you, I would go back to point number one. You gotta remember when you were called because you were in just as much as need as that person was when you were called. Following Jesus means extending the mercy of God to those around you. It means not doing everything differently but just changing how you're doing it by inviting Jesus into that space. <clears throat> the last thing I'll say is a moment ago, I asked you guys to call to mind a moment that you uh, really began to follow Jesus. And I do not want to assume that everybody in here thought of a time. I don't want to assume that you were like, yeah, this is the moment. I remember exactly when it happened. And if that's you, that's okay. One, we're really glad you're here. And two, why not today? 
Just like me in the back of the Suburban, eight-year-old little kid. I didn't really know. I mean, I knew Jesus. I didn't know fully what that meant. But I was like, hey, why not today? And I just said yes. And you might be thinking, but how, how do I know the mercy of God is going to come to me when I start following Jesus? How do I know this is true? How do I know this is really who Jesus was? Sure, he had a meal with some sinners, but how do I know this is true? Well, because the same Jesus, if you follow the story, would end up dying on a cross, taking on our sin, taking on our shame, taking on our story, and then giving us his. Giving us his perfection, giving us his righteousness, giving us his new life with a new purpose, with a new way to live. I know because that same Jesus was willing to die for me. And that same Jesus died for you. So why not just follow him today? Today is the day of salvation. And if that's you, if you're somebody in here, you're like, I kind of want to do that. (laughs) We're going to be up front. We'd love to talk with you. Um, We're going to pray um, and after I'm done praying, we'll take communion together. So if you have your uh, elements, go ahead and grab those and we'll um, take that together. And this is, if you don't really know what this is or just by way of reminder, this cup and this um, grape juice, it's not wine, this cup and this grape juice is the reminder of what I had just said. That that cracker is the body of Jesus broken for you. And that grape juice is his blood spilled for you the blood of the new covenant that writes his law on your heart, that gives you the Holy Spirit, that justifies you by grace alone. This is what we're celebrating when we take the elements. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you're standing here in this room. And even if we've been following you for years, you're still here saying, come on. Keep going, keep following me. That Jesus, you're full of grace and mercy, that your heart gravitates towards those in need. And so we all join together right now and we say we need you. We need you, not just generally speaking, but we need you in our marriages. We need you in our relationship with our kids or our friends and our sinful habits. We need you, we need you in every area of life. I'm so grateful, Jesus, that you gravitate towards those that are in need. And so I pray you would even call to mind right now um, moments where we follow Jesus and moments in our lives, our daily routines that we can invite you into. Give us real clarity, Holy Spirit. What does that look like? How can we do that practically? Thank you for your infinite wisdom for your love and your grace. We love you in Jesus' name, amen.
can spin the world around and hold me ever close. Who can search the depths of me and love me to the core? Who controls the world I see And walks me through it all No one but you Who's made the righteous blind? Who's paved my way with grace? Love me through my darkest hours A thousand different ways No Sing to the Lord, hear the rocks cry out, see the mountains bow, every heart come, worship the
We're so glad you were with us today. We hope something came to mind when you thought about when you were first called by Jesus to follow him. If something came to mind, share that with someone. Right now, in the living room or wherever you are, share that with someone or someone this week that you feel called to share this with. Go share your story and let them know how all that God has done for you. Uh, thanks for being here and we'll see you next time.